10 most overpowered Yu-Gi-Oh cards of all time. Now, I know we're going into 2023, and even if people are looking at this video from like a year from now, they're going to be like, oh, Avery, this, that card's not overpowered anymore. This card is. Look, out of the 20 plus years that Yu-Gi-Oh's been around, who knows how much longer it's going to be around. It could be around for another 10 years, 5 years, 20 years, whatever. This is currently what I feel, in my opinion, is the top 10 most overpowered Yu-Gi-Oh cards of all time in the 20 plus years of this game's history. Moving into 2023 with a new year and a new overpowered power creep of Yu-Gi-Oh. Spoiler alert, it's not Exodia, Blue Eyes, or Dark Magician. So relax your anus when it comes to that. But let's dive on into it, shall we? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is your host with the most, Avery LR32, here and destroy the ever-living top 10 boo-boo stain off of that subscribe button so we can climb even further beyond the 1K ladder. I really do appreciate all the support. Currently sitting at 1,045 subscribers. Channel's growing a little bit slow, but, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh's in a downtime, so I understand that. We just got to get creative with our content. So let's just go ahead and dive on into it. I'm not going to waste y'all's time. Y'all probably busy stuffing your face with cookies and Christmas and Hanukkah and Boxing Day, all that fun stuff. So, happy holidays to each and every one of you. I clearly, I obviously and I appreciate you all from the bottom of my heart. If I could speak today, I'm just, bleh, my, my tongue's too big for my mouth. That's what she said. <laughs> At number 10, I've got two cards, actually. Dark Arm and Judgment Dragon. So, if you're new to the channel and you haven't heard my backstory on Yu-Gi-Oh!, these cards actually had just came out when I started playing what I call competitively. I started playing Yu-Gi-Oh! competitively in 2008. Uh, and I say competitively, that's when I went to my first like local OTS store, right? And I, you know, started going to locals every Saturday and playing and meeting people and getting better. I had played before that, like my local Books a Million, which is like a bookstore for those of you who don't know. Uh, the fuck? <laughs> um, thought my curtain was open. Um, and so, you know, I went to my local Books a Million like 2007 and stuff and like sat there on the bookstore floor and played with people and stuff. But it wasn't really a super competitive scene. It wasn't until 2008, 2009 that I started going to regionals and things like that. 2008 specifically is when I first started because two weeks after I started going to locals, they changed the fusion deck to the extra deck and we went into the synchro era. And I remember Dark Arm Dragon and Judgment Dragon being so overpowered. The fact that these cards were in an era where hard once per turns weren't a thing, being able to nuke the board with JD, being able to pop cards one after another with Dark Arm. Dark Arm, you could argue, has been power creep more than say like something like judgment dragon even though both of these cards are at three now which if you told me that 2009 i would have laughed in your face because everybody thought that both these cards needed to be banned and now they're both at three and no one's really playing them i mean unless you're going to play that new arm dragon neos fusion you can use dark arm dragon <laughs> i think that that's really hilarious we're going to probably be talking about that in a future video so yeah dark arm dragon is one of my favorite cards of all time love this card it's super cool at number nine i have another multiples of cards the big dragon rulers. The reason why I have the dragon rulers on this list is because of the fact that, in my humble opinion, I feel that the dragon rulers, when they came out in 2013, completely shaped how Yu-Gi-Oh! is played today. And this is like 10 years ago we're talking now. The dragon rulers, when they came out, completely shifted the speed of the game to a point where unless you ban everything that has come out since the dragon rulers, the game will never be that old school, slow Yu-Gi-Oh ever again. The Dragon Rulers made Yu-Gi-Oh a game where you went from, I'm going to summon a monster, set a couple cards in my spell and trap zone and end my turn to, I'm going to build a big ass board and drop a dookie on the field. And if you can't clear it, you lose the ball game pin. We now know in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, as many people call it, by turn two, sometimes turn three, if you've won or lost the game. Whereas back in what people call old school Yu-Gi-Oh, I would say 2012 and back, it would take you probably about 10 to 15 minutes in that first game to know whether you won or lost the game just because of how much slower the game was. People like this new Yu-Gi-Oh! People don't like this new Yu-Gi-Oh! Same goes for old Yu-Gi-Oh! Some like it, some hate it. There are pros and cons to both eras of Yu-Gi-Oh! as I'm going to call it. But the Dragon Rulers really is what set the stage and the fact that they were a tier 0 deck just unlike any other tier 0 deck we'd even seen before it should speak for itself how insane these cards were. Uh, so let's see here. At number seven, I have Cold Wave. So Cold Wave is an interesting card here. It says this card can only be activated at the start of main phase one. So it's like Pot of Extravagance. You gotta activate the start of the main phase. Until your next turn, you and your opponent cannot play or set any spell or trap cards. So what you mean to tell me is that I can activate this 
You can't activate imperm. You can't, even when it's your turn, set any back row like floodgates to try and break my board that way. You just have to have your back row offline. Could you imagine if Cold Wave was still around in today's Yu-Gi-Oh? I mean, I remember playing with Cold Wave when I was playing Rescue Cat OTK back when Dark Strike Fighter was like a $50, $60 card before it got banned and has now been errated. I mean, the card... It should tell you that over 10 years after it's been banned, it is still an insane card that I think without some sort of insane errata can never be unbanned. And like, it's insane. Like it's it's similar to that as something like Roll Oppression or Imperial Order or Banning these Eminence where you just lock the opponent out of special summoning or spells in the case of Imperial Order. Just being able to lock your opponent out of not being able to play any back row, whether we're in a heavy back row format or not at the time, it's insane because even if like the top deck is an Eldritch, you know, every deck plays spell cards. So, you know, what do they need to play spell cards to get their combos going? They just can't. Like this card is just insane. I can't count. Dark Arm and JD were number 10. The Dragon Rulers are number nine. Cold Wave was number eight. Imperial Order is number seven. I'm losing track here. At number seven, Imperial Order. So I'm sure that y'all know what this card does. You negate all spell effects on the field. Once per turn during the standby phase, you must pay 700 life points. This is not optional or this card is destroyed. Now, before the errata on it, which made it during both players' standby phases, it used to be just during your own standby phase. And you had the choice of paying the 700 life points or not. Similar to like Messenger of Peace, where you have the choice if you want to pay 100 life points or not. And the fact that even with an errata, this card is now banned again, should speak for itself how insane this card has been throughout the years of Yu-Gi-Oh! and how insane it is today. Locking the opponent out of a game mechanic, whether it's summoning monsters and activating the activating their effects like with Mystic Mine or True King of All Calamities, locking them out of trap cards like we saw with World Decree. World Decree was banned years ago for a similar reason, I believe, because of Imperial Order. It just locks you out. Not being able to play any spell cards. Spell cards are so much better than trap cards in modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Imperial Order just says, screw you, you can't play them. It made a lot of decks unplayable, like Sky Striker, because you hit them with Imperial Order. If they don't have a quick play to chain to it, you just lose the ball game. Imperial Order, I don't think, can ever come back. It would need some sort of insane errata to actually come back. It's just, it, it's too good. It's just way too good. I never want to see this card again. So at number six here, I have Return from the Different Dimension. So what does Return do? So you pay half your life points, special summon as many of your banished monsters as possible. During the end phase, banish all monsters that were special summoned by this effect. Yeah, no, that, that stuff never came up because either A, you were OTKing the opponent that turn, so you were just winning the game anyway, or like what we saw in a Dragon Ruler format, you could just activate Return from the Different Dimension, pay half your life points, get a bunch of your banished dragons back, and then you can make exceed plays, or you could just attack for game. You can make synchro plays. Whatever the case was, return from the different dimension can just never come back. I mean, there, there's no way that I could ever see this card being healthy. And the fact that in multiple formats, it was shown to be a problematic card when you look back through the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! Shameless plug, you can go watch my retrospective videos to get an idea for that. This card was always an issue, and it wasn't until post-2013 Dragon Ruler format that Return finally got banned. It was at three, it went to one, and then it finally got banned years after being at one because it was just always being abused. And the fact that you pay half your life points means the card is always live. No matter how low your opponent's life points are in the game, they can just return from the different dimension you out of their ass and just beat your butthole in. It was absolutely disgusting, especially in Dragon Ruler format. Going along with that, at number five, I have Sixth Sense. Now, here's the interesting story about Sixth Sense. Sixth Sense was released at a time back in 2013. Again, Dragon Ruler format that, you know, there were a lot of problems in that format during that time. But the TCG and the OCG balance were still tied at the hip. They were both the same. So whatever got banned in the OCG in Japan was also banned here in the TCG. Well, the OCG got Sixth Sense many years before we ever got six cents. We didn't get six cents until Legendary Collection Joey's World, where it was released as a common and it was like $20 out of the gate. Even when six cents first came out, Konami put out a ban list. I believe it was an emergency ban list. I could be wrong, but it was a ban list that said, hey, we know that this card isn't out yet, but we're putting six cents at one because Konami already knew if six cents came out, in the TCG and was at three copies, it would be a slobber knocker fest. Like it would just be disgusting. So they put the card at one right out of the gate when it was released. And what it does is that you declare two numbers from one to six. Okay, so it's a dice roll. When your opponent rolls a six-sided die, and if the result is one of the numbers you declared, you draw that many cards. Otherwise, send a number of cards from the top of your deck to the graveyard equal to the result. 
You know what that means, boys and girls. Ha <laughs> ha, Dragon World is coming for that ass again, boys and girls. So typically what you would do with six cents back in the day is that you would just flip it and you'd say, I'm going to call five and six. Because no matter which one got hit, you were plussing as the Dragon Ruler player. There was no negative. By calling five and six, if the opponent rolled a six, then you got to draw six cards and, you know, mill five. I believe that's what it is, right? Yeah, you draw that many cards. Otherwise, send a number of cards from the top of the deck to the graveyard equal to the result. Yeah, so you call, you know, five and six. If they roll something like a four, okay, you're going to mill four cards. Uh, you're either going to draw five or six cards. Anything else is a mill. So, like... You can't, you can't lose with that. You're getting dragon ruler monsters, excuse me, in the graveyard that you can just banish more dragon monsters or whatever attribute to bring them out from the grave. So you're never losing any advantage. Any cards like that were played during that time, like card trooper, sacred sword of seven stars, uh, like you were never going to hit those cards anyway. Like it's like pot of desires. You banishing 10, you were never going to hit those cards anyway. It don't matter. So six cents, I'm so glad that it's gone. I remember having to play against it and use it myself because I played Dragon Rulers and it was just toxic. Being able to call five and six and draw a crap ton of cards was disgusting. Like, Lord have mercy. At number four, I have Elder Entity Norden. So Norden requires one Synchro Orc Seize Monster plus one Synchro Orc Seize Monster. Ha <laughs> ha! You were never doing that. And if you were, uh, no, nah, you, you were doing it wrong, pimp. And it says, when this card is special summoned, you can target one level four or lower monster in your graveyard. Special summon it, but its effects are negated. Also banish it when this card leaves the field. Y you see the card on screen, right? Wh whichever side I decide to put it on. That bitch is a level four. You can instant fusion this puppy out. So you know what people used to do back in Zo Zodiac Tier 0 format in 2017? You would go instant fusion. We would summon out Norden. We would get out another monster. It's a faction again, but we didn't care. It was just an extender. If it was a Zodiac monster, you started placing all your Zodiac exceeds on it, and you just win the ball game. It was absolutely disgusting. It was an extender for any deck. And just, you combined it with a tuner. You can make a level five synchro if the tuner was level one. You can make a rank four exceed if you got out like a level four monster. The card was absolutely insane. It's still banned today for a reason. You know, no one was ever properly fusion summoning this card. You know, if it said it can only be special summoned by using the above fusion materials, then it'd be balanced because you have to get either a synchro and an exceed. You would have to get at least one synchro and one exceed out on the board to make it and then use like polymerization or something. No one ain't going to do that baby back bullshit. So until Norn gets some sort of insane errata, it's just never coming back. So at number three, <laughs> what do you think I got? We got Mystic Douchebag, aka Mystic Mine. I'm not even going to explain what this card does because y'all know what this trash does. Mystic Mine is... Actually, when I was doing the research for this video, very similar to True King of All Calamities. You know, you get out two True King of All Calamities, the opponent can't activate any monster effects or attack. But why commit to two True King of All Calamities to lock the opponent out of playing the game when you can just drop out a Mystic Mine for less of a cost? You know, when you're committing to two True King of All Calamities, yes, technically that's better, but I mean, Mystic Mind's just a field spell. You drop that out, and like, unless the opponent has back row hate in their main deck, they're going to lose that game one, whether you're going first or second, unless they've got like negates on the board. And if you're playing Dark Ruler No More and crap like that, then, well, you're just going to win the ballgame anyway. Mystic Mind is, in my opinion, I feel the most broken field spell that's ever been printed. And that's saying a lot, considering that we used to have to deal with Chicken Game, which was essentially an upstart goblin. But the thing is with Chicken Game was that, yes, you, it would let you draw a card, but you had to be playing multiple copies that were essentially just upstart goblins in the grand scheme of things to play an FTK deck that if your opponent hits you with Droll and Lockbird, you were just losing the game. I don't think we had Call by the Grave at that point, but I could be wrong. Regardless, Mystic Mine is just so easy to get to because it's a field spell. It locks the opponent out of playing the game at all, and it allows decks that you shouldn't be losing to, to beat you. And I talked about this all the time on Mystic Mind was at three. You know, I talked about how Sky Striker was held together by glue, gorilla tape, and Mystic Mind because Mystic Mind is what made the deck work. You know, I lost to a Sky Striker player, one, because he cheated me at that regional in Boca Raton, but also because he sat on Mystic Mind. I played through all three of his Mystic Minds, but he still beat me just because of the Mystic Minds. Like, it wasn't fair. If it weren't for Mystic Mind, I would have tapped his ass. So Mystic Mine, I feel, can never come back. I don't really feel like that there's any sort of errata that you can get this thing. Like, it's 
It's just hot dog water. It needs to stay out of the game. So that was number three. At number two, we have the newly unforbidden Yadagarasu. So it can't be special summon just like any other spirit monster. During the end phase of the turn, this card is normal summon or foot face up. You return it to the hand. And if this card inflicts bad damage to your opponent, skip the draw phase of their next turn. In 2022, that doesn't sound very broken, but you have to keep in mind that when this card came out in 2003, when hand control was a big thing, again, you should go look at my retrospective on that, uh, that deck. Um, it was very broken. You know, you had cards like confiscation, delinquent duo to rip cards out of the opponent's hand to where Yonagarasu and even Time Seal by extension became very broken in that regard. Being able to, you know, have the opponent only be playing with a couple cards in their hand. Oh, and then they can't draw with Time Seal or Yada, or if they just don't have a hand at all, then Yada just auto wins you the game. It, it was absolutely toxic for its time. And by extension of uh, huh, our number one spot, it became even worse. I also want to give an honorable mention as well to Dark Strike Fighter pre errata that card was just disgusting stealing wins left and right it was absolutely insane at number one obviously i gotta have pre errata chaos emperor dragon envoy of the end so it can't be normal summoner set must be special summoned from your hand by banishing one light and one dark monster from your graveyard once per turn you can pay a thousand life points send as many cards in both players hands and on the field as possible to the graveyard notice that that says send not destroy then it inflict 300 damage to your opponent for each card sent to the graveyard uh, to the opponent's graveyard by this effect. Now, the errata is that you cannot activate other cards or effects during the turn you activate this card's effect. However, the pre errata did not have that stipulation. So, the way that Chaos Upper Dragon was used back in the day when it was released in like 2004, you would drop it out, banish a light or dark monster from your graveyard, use its effect, send all cards on both players' hand and field to the grave. And again, notice that it, send, it says send, it does not say destroy. So, anything that triggers when it's destroyed would not trigger. And then the opponent would take damage. But more importantly, if you have a Sangin or a Witch of the Black Forest on the field, then you can add a monster from your deck to your hand with 1,500 less attack or less 1,500 less defense from your deck to your hand, respectively. So you would add Yadagarasu. You would normal summon the Yadagarasu attack for 300, activate the effect of Yada. Now the opponent loses the game because they have no cards on their field. They have no cards in their hand. You only have the Yada, but you don't care because now because of Yada, they can't draw. I feel even in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! today, it, that is still the most broken thing that Yu-Gi-Oh! has ever conceived. Granted, this was back in 2004. We didn't have hand traps. We didn't have Effect Baylor. We didn't have Ash Blossom. We didn't have Nibiru. We didn't have these things. But the fact that if something like that was still unhinged today, I feel that it would be still very broken. I feel that even with all the cards that have come out since 2004, I feel that that could be pulled off even more consistently as like, honestly, maybe a really broken going second deck. So, guys, these are my top 10 most broken Yu-Gi-Oh cards of all time. Is there anything that I missed? Like I said, I gave an honorable mention to Dark Strike Fighter. Is there a card in my research that I just wasn't thinking of that would be broken? I thought about Substitute and Mass Driver, but I wanted to do cards that I feel for the longest amount of time, like a big stretch of the game's lifespan, they were broken or used and really help, I guess, set in people's mind how broken these cards were. You know, Substitute and Mass Driver were broken for a time, but they were taken care of after like a format, format and a half. So guys, thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think down in the comments below and I will see you in the next video.